God's grace is good, isn't it? Amen. Welcome this morning to uh, Oak Rider Baptist Church. We're glad to see everybody here this morning. Let's just continue in worship this morning and remember that it is because of the grace of God that we enjoy the things that we enjoy. Because without him holding this world together, without him organizing all the chaos that is in this world, there would be nothing for us to enjoy. Because the Bible says that anything that, that happens good to you is a gift from God. And so let's remember that this morning, that God is the giver of all things that are good.
got me through thinking.
the children's church so the children's church can go out at this time he is worthy amen that was some good stuff I tell you you gotta stop doing those really good songs right before I come up here I've been crying my eyes out and I come up and try to preach in that it's kind of hard to see. I have a hard time seeing. Chris, I understand with your glasses, dude. I, I feel you. I, I'm right there. I have to do the same thing. I, have to put, I was talking to somebody the other day, and they said, I'm about losing my eyes. I go, have you started going, looking at readers yet? I'm thinking, yes, yes, I have. So uh, we're there already. Um, I try to get away with it sometimes. If I'm not reading too many verses, but uh, we might have to use them today. So if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 18. 1 Samuel chapter 18. And we'll be looking at verses 5 through 9. We're going to be looking at the whole text. But our, what I want to read to you is verses 5 through 9. As we continue our series on growing through conflict. Again, it's not enough to go through it. But the purpose of conflict is to grow through it. And... Um, during, while you're going through conflict, it is important to discern. You ever notice you get in conflict and you don't know why this conflict started? Why are we arguing about this? Uh, not only what's going on, but why is it going on? We need to search the scriptures. We need to seek God's guidance. If the issue is you... By the way, I'm going to tell you, sometimes it is. It's always you. It's never me. <laughs> no, I'm saying that's, that's how I'm speaking uniform. I'm speaking for us all. Because <laughs> I'm the same way. It's, it's, I'm always right. Bible, by the way, that's biblical. Every man does what's right in his own eyes. <laughs> right? But if it's you, ask God to fix you. If it's not you... Stay righteous and graceful and let God fix them. We so often want to fix that person and we're the one that's broken. We so often want to fix them and not let God do it. If it is not you, then stay righteous and graceful. Let God fix them. Here in our text, Saul is clearly at fault and to blame for this conflict. And David continues to behave righteously. My mom used to have a saying, and I couldn't stand when she said it, but when me and my brothers and sisters would fight, because I know none of y'all ever fought your brothers and sisters, but me, we did. We did. And again, we would get to that point where, Mom, it's her fault. No, it's his fault, right? Always. My mama says, it takes two to tango. But guess what? In our story today, it wasn't about both. It was Saul. David was continuing to do right. David was continuing to live righteously and wisely. Saul continued to get worse. There's usually two parties involved. And yes, third parties try to get involved. And sometimes we let them. But there's usually only two parties involved. One filled with the Spirit of God, and the other 
filled with the spirit of themselves. The one filled with themselves is the instigator of this conflict. Always. So my question to you is, when you're in conflict, who's leading you? You or the Spirit of God? There are three causes of this conflict in our scriptures. First of all, Saul disobeyed God multiple times and was rejected by God to continue being king and the Spirit of God left him. Look at this. We're going to look at some background again. Hey, now I want everybody to think about the conflict they're in right now. How many of you, you're not in a conflict right now? Not this very moment. But I mean, when you live, step out of these doors, you're not in a conflict with anyone. Okay. 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 Just, just Van. Okay, Mike. Okay. There's a couple. Okay. So I'm talking to not those people. <laughs> uh, I mean, you can, you can listen to this too, but I'm talking to those right now as far as those who are in conflict, do you think that your past experiences, your past, uh, what you've been through, has any bearing on the way you handle conflict? Absolutely. And we're going to see that because if we look here at 1 Samuel, we've got a couple of verses, all this backstory to see why. Saul is so angry and bitter at David. Here's why. And Samuel said, this is 1 Samuel 13, 13. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom forever. In other words, Saul, had you obeyed God, you would have been king. Your kingdom would have been forever. After you passed away, Jonathan would have taken over, and so on and so forth. Had you have been obedient, had you have been faithful, your kingdom would have continued. However, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. But guess what? Saul's disobedience just wasn't this time. It happens again in fa chapter 15. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Is this a very clear commandment? It is very clear. And Saul is told to go completely wipe out everything. And when Samuel comes along after this should have been done, Saul says, I've done what I've been told to do. And Samuel goes, really? That's funny because I start hearing bleeding of sheep. I start hearing that. I start hearing that. How can sheep, they're dead, do that? Oh, but no, no, we kept the best sheep. We wanted to give it to God as a, as a sacrifice. We wanted to, to praise the Lord. And this is where Samuel says one of the greatest statements in the Bible, in my opinion. It says, I greatly regret that I have set up, this is God speaking to him, Saul is king for he has turned his back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel and he cried unto the Lord all night. Then Samuel said, has the Lord has great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. Now look what else he's accusing Saul. He's accusing him of being rebellious. For rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He also has rejected you from being king. This continues. I will not return with you for you have rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. So Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent, for he is not a man that he should relent. 
Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Let me tell you something. When I bring this history in right here, you can see why Saul would be angry. Granted, he did it to himself, but how often do we see in times today where people do it to themselves but still play the victim card? But you can see how he would be angry, how he'd be bitter. This is why he's upset with David. Now look at our text, verses 5 through 9. 1 Samuel 18, verses 5 through 9 says, So David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now it had happened as they were coming home when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine that the women had come out of all the city of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. So the woman sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. When Saul was very angry, and the, the saying displeased him, and he said, They have ascribed to David his ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, help us to see ourselves in this. Lord, so often how we, of our own bitterness, of our own jealousy, of our own anger, of our own hatred, of our own, sometimes, Lord, as you're dealing with our hearts, Lord, and we're not dealing well with the chastening of the Lord, and so often we want to pull the blame out on everyone else around us. But Lord, help us. Lord, help us to realize that we are not accountable for what other people say to us. We are not accountable for what other people do to us. We are accountable for how we speak, for how we respond, for how we react. Lord, that's what we're accountable for. And Lord, help us, instead of pushing the blame on someone else, to man or woman up and take responsibility for our own actions, for our own words. Lord, help us to realize that so often we're in conflict. Your spirit is not leading us in our conflict. We're being led by ourselves. More, but Lord, let's get down to the nitty gritty. We're not being led by ourselves. We're being led by the devil. Lord, help us to see the right path. The right path is to be godly in the midst of conflict. To act wisely in the midst of conflict. In your name I pray. Amen. So that's the backstory. So we see here that King Saul was a big man, and you see him pouting. That's why I was reading it like I was reading it. Did you see that in that passage? This big king? Hey, the Bible says he was head and shoulders above. He was a big man, big warrior type. And yet he is this feeble, whiny, crying Spoiled brat. How often do we act like this? But it says that he began to eye David from this moment. Let me tell you something. This conflict that you're in right now, it was more than just the last event. You can see this conflict with David was not just because of this song that came out. David has killed his ten thousands and Saul only his thousands. That was only the icing on the cake. It had been brewing. It had been brewing. Tis why it's so important that when we begin to see that conflict is starting to brew, that we deal with it immediately. Amen. Take it to God. Saul does not. Saul continues to let it fester and fester and fester, and now we see where they are are at the point where he wants to kill David because he is not, I'm sorry, I'm turn my phone off. I, but he is at the point where he's ready to kill David because, because of David? David's not the victim. David's not, David hasn't done anything. 
David is following God's leadership. The issue here is what the conflict is, is the conflict is not between David and Saul as it is. It should be between Saul and God. Maybe you are at the place where you're having conflict with somebody else and really the conflict's not even with you and them. Maybe it's with you and God. Maybe you haven't had something resolved. Maybe you haven't had sin taken care of. Or maybe you just, you won't let, you won't, you're stubborn like me and we're stubborn and we just say, God, it's my way. And they're going to see it. That's King Saul. We don't understand so often why we're at conflict and a lot of that, I begin to believe that's because a lot of times we don't realize what the other party is going through. See, we know coming into the conflict, we know our backstory. We know our past. We know what we're keeping from God. We know what God's keeping. But we don't know the other party. We don't know what the other party's going through. We don't understand that, hey, when the Spirit of God leaves you, thank the Lord He cannot. This is different times. But what if you could, for just one second, think of your life if the Spirit of God could leave your life. Horrible, isn't it? Horrible. This is part of what Saul's going through. So there was three, two, two, not only was he disobedient to God, he was jealous of David. Due to God's hand on his life, he is an anointed. He's the next king. And by the way, you know what's really amazing? If you'll read this chapter, abs- according to this chapter, you're going to read everybody, everybody loves David. Not everybody loves Raymond. It's everybody loves David. The Bible says all of Israel and Judah love David. Jonathan loved David. Michael Saul's daughter, love David. Now think of Saul. Let me get this straight. Everyone, including my own family, loves the guy I loathe. How much more stress and anger and resentment would that add to our lives? Knowing that everyone that we loved loved the one that we hated. A person who is disobedient to God will be at conflict with those who are obedient to God. That's some deep words. I'm going to say it again. A person who is disobedient to God will be at conflict with those who are obedient to God. And secondly, a person being chastened by God will be at conflict with those being blessed by God. You ever sit back and watch the one person you don't like to continue to succeed, succeed, and it just makes you sick to your stomach every time? And those people come around you, oh, look how awesome they're doing. You're like, yeah, great. And you're just sick to your stomach because you're so done with seeing them be victorious and be blessed. And the issue is this. The issue is you're not mad at them. You're mad because you're not being blessed by God. Have you ever asked yourself why? Why am I not being blessed like that person? Maybe you are. We're just ungrateful. Jonathan was next in line to be king the way it should have been. Don't you think he had the, hey, he had the right, he would have been, he had a reason to be angry and be bitter, but he's not. Hey, listen to this. Jonathan, when he learned that David had been anointed, he willingly submitted to the will of God. He should have been king. And he says, no. God anointed you, David. And Jonathan will spend so much time Having to be the in between between him and his father, his own father. Kids, I'm not recommending this, by the way. But dad was wrong. Dad was evil. Dad was wrong. And Jonathan 
was trying to protect his friend. Every Christian has a responsibility to respond in a Christ-like manner while in conflict. It doesn't matter what was said. It doesn't matter what was done. You and I have a God-given duty to respond. Not react, but respond in a godly manner. How do we do this? We do this by remembering three principles. Number one, remember to remain obedient to God. Remember to remain obedient to God. When you're in that conflict, remember, hey, I can fight this battle, but I've got to fight this battle and be obedient to God in the process. So what does that mean with how many times does the Bible say, love one another, uplift, edify, encourage, strengthen? That's what the Bible tells us to do. That's how we obey God. But let's look at Saul's life for a second. Most of this, all this day is going to be a comparison. Comparison of David and Saul. So Saul, how's Saul doing with this? He tries to kill David. Was that obedient to God? No, actually... What was obedient to God, Saul, you wanted to kill somebody. You had your opportunity. I told you to go kill King Amalek. I told you to kill him. But did you do it? By the way, that's one of the coolest parts of Scripture again. When Samuel, the high priest, walks up and sees Amalek standing there and just cuts him into pieces. Don't even think about it. Just, will the man of God do that? When he's told to. <laughs> Now, I'm thankful that God never told me to do that. I'd be like, mm -mm, I don't know if I could do that. But God told Samuel to do that. But now you want to kill the person that God's anointed. By the way, keep in mind, it's amazing the contrast here because Saul is trying to kill God's anointed, yet David will not one time lay a finger to Saul because he's God's anointed. The complete extreme contrast between these two. He's not being obedient to God. He's trying to kill David. By the way, he tries to spear him two times by himself. He tries to spear him. You know what's amazing? If I show up to King Saul's house I'm, as my normal duty to play the harp, and he tries to throw a spear through me, you think I'm coming back tomorrow? Probably. No. David does. David does. In fact, it's twice that this happens. But if that doesn't work, hey, I'll get other people to do it. I'll have him killed. Man, where was this Saul when he was told to kill everything? But then he gets his family all mixed up in it. He trades his family for his anger and jealousy, and how often do we get our family all tied up in our conflicts? Guys, there are some things you don't need to go home and just tell your wife everything. Maybe the conflicts that you have, whether it's between you and God, that you can discuss with your wife. But if it's conflicts with somebody else, you don't need to go dump that on your wife. You need to take that to God. Come see me, unless it's me you have the conflict with. If it's me you have the conflict with, even more reason to come see me. Come, let us reason together. Let's sit down and talk about what's going on. But Saul tried to kill Jonathan, his own son. Turn your pages over to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 33. Leave your finger back. We're going to go back to 18, but 1 Samuel 30, I mean, sorry, 1 Samuel 20, verse 33. Then Saul cast a spear at him to kill him. Who is this? Not David, Jonathan, his own son. Do you see what anger and hostility does? Saul is willing to kill his own son because he's so angry and bitter at David. 
How often, guys, how often do our wives catch our blasts of anger or our children catch our blasts of anger? Then Saul hurled his spear at him to strike him down. Saul hurled his spear at him to kill him. That is his own son. Saul is furious and totally controlled by his anger. Saul's anger burned against Jonathan now. Why? Because he's trying to help David. In a fit of passion sought to kill Jonathan, his own son, the heir apparent to the throne in his eyes. But then he uses his daughters. Look, go back to our text. It's 1 Samuel 18. He uses his daughters to sabotage or to, or to kill David. Look at verse 17. Let my hand not be against, let my hand not be against him. He says, I'm not going to kill him. But let the hand of the Philistines be against him. Look at verse 21. So Saul said, I will give her to him, my daughter Michael, that she may be a snare to him. You're using your daughter? By the way, what kind of a father is this? Not only to use your daughter, but at the same time is, if, you love, if you're a father and, you, and she loves David, by the way, how many fathers have daughters? If you got your girl, your daughter comes home, she's met a godly man, a very godly man, and they're at marrying age, and he's at marrying age, and they're, 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 he's a good man, you like, would you have anything against him getting married? Wouldn't you want her, wouldn't you want her to be happy? Hey, she didn't bring a tattoo face, and, and, I have, and by the way, I have tattoos all over my body, but I'm saying what we, the, the, here's what I'm saying. Bringing someone home and daddy should approve of. And, she, and, 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 and it's David. And how can you not approve? God has already called him to be king. God has already chosen David. Let me tell you something. When God chooses who you want to be with, that's the way to go. But watch this. He has no problem with killing off the man of his daughter's dreams. What kind of a father would do that? A, man, a father who's filled with anger and hostility, and really, is it against David? No. It's not against David. It's against God. Because you took my kingdom away. You took your spirit away from me. That was mine. And David just happens to be the one caught in the way. So now let's look at David. Is David being obedient to God? Absolutely. Look at verse 5. David, so David went out wherever Saul sent him. Now, granted, verse 5, David doesn't know that Saul's out to get him. But I don't think it changes. I think David's still faithful to do whatever Saul commands him to do. Whatever Saul calls him to do, he's faithful to do it. So David went wherever Saul sent him. Look at verse 10. So David still played music with his hand, as at other times. But David's also, he remains Humble. How do you remain humble? Someone trying to kill you. Look at verse 18. Who am I and what is my life for my father's family in Israel that I should be the son in law to the king? Well, first of all, time out. Technically speaking, you're actually the king right now. Granted, because of the, the, uh, rites of passage, they haven't done that, but technically this kingdom's been taken from Saul, and David was anointed. But he's still humble. Look at verse 23. Does it seem to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law, seeing I am poor and lightly esteemed man? David is very humble to a king who's not even king anymore. But David still has respect for this king, for God's anointed. 
Again, it's completely opposite of where David is still esteeming and still being obedient to God and still being humble to the king, to God's anointed, and, the God, and then King Saul is trying to kill God's anointed. David remains dedicated to King Saul. No matter what King Saul asked David to do, hey, I'm going to put you in this army. I'm going to put you in this battle. I'm going to put you in this battle. For what purpose? To kill him off. But he continues. By the way, didn't David do something like this? And I don't know if he learned this from Saul. Or, um, but remember when, when David said, hey, I can put Uriah on the front lines. Because I want him to get a promotion. He had a promotion in the glory. But it was to kill him. And how did Uriah respond when he came back? Hey, go, go spend time with your wife. No, I'm going to protect my king. I'm going to sleep on the front door. I'm going to protect my king. That's the same thing David is. David is trying to continue to respect his king and to, to serve his king and even though he don't know if he's going to lose his life, he don't know at any time Saul could take his life himself or any armies that he's going to send, but David still continues to follow. David still continues righteously. The second thing is this. Remember, remember to maintain, I'm sorry, remember to remain righteous in your living. By the way, conflict is not sinful. It's how you react and how you respond in the conflict that can be sinful. Amen. And are you remember when you're going through a conflict, are you living righteously? Are you doing what's right? Are you thinking what's right? Not just about yourself, but about the other person. So let's see how Saul's doing. We know, we've already read this. Saul is angry and jealous. But let's be honest. Who should Saul be angry with? How often are we angry at the wrong people? How often are we jealous of the wrong people? Saul brought all this to himself. God told him that. Look at verses 8 and 9. Then Saul was angry, and the saying displeased him that David has, it was the next verse, he's going to say it. And then he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed only thousands. This is the pouting pity party. And again, so often our conflicts, that's all we're thinking about. I'm thinking of myself. I'm thinking of my pride. I'm thinking how I've been done wrong. My king was ripped out underneath me and given to this boy. Guys, nothing belongs to us. Everything belongs to God. So saw I, David, from that day on. If we do not confess and forsake the sin of envy, we will find it difficult to trust God. For Christ said, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from one, the only God? We're in conflict so often because we want to seek the glory of others. But in reality, we should be seeking the glory that comes only from God. And by the way, one of the best ways to do that is remain righteous in your conflict. Remain a good steward of the friends, of the relationships, of the people God's put in your life by doing what's right in conflict. That will bring glory from God. But then God sends... A distressing spirit. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. As Christians, we cannot be possessed by the devil. But we sure can be oppressed by the devil. And let me tell you something. 
If you let anger and resentment set itself in your life, you can guarantee you're a, you're a, a nest for, for demons. Because demons have no problem joining in with that and, and, and adding to your anger, adding to your embarrassment, adding to your discouragement, adding to everything and making it worse and worse. And you will continue to grow and grow bitter and bitter. And you can't. This is why it's good to take care of business early on. Had Saul gone to God right off the bat and been a true man to say, Lord, we see a, an attempt at, we saw an attempt, later on you'll see there's an attempt by Saul to repent. And it really wasn't a repent. How many of y'all had kids that those kids would come and say, I'm sorry, and really the only reason they were saying sorry so they could get what they wanted at the other end? You can't go because of this. I'm sorry, can I go now? No. That was Saul. Can I get my kingdom back? No. It wasn't a true repentance. But this distressing spirit came upon Saul. By the way, who brought it to Saul? God did. He said, how could a good God send an evil spirit to bring distress to Paul? Because God is absolutely sovereign. The actions of any evil spirit would be subject to the authority of God. I want that to pay close attention to that. Because God still has final rule, final reign, final authority over even the demonic spirits. Let me tell you something. That is absolutely awesome. That's what all power means. Therefore, it was according to God's permission that the Spirit was allowed to come upon Saul to bring him distress. Saul had already rejected God and God had rejected him from being king. God had a special reason for allowing the Spirit to incite Saul to action against David. This was all part of God's plan. By sending David away and making him captain over a thousand, Saul inadvertently increased David's popularity. Now let me tell you something. That is humorous there. Because you have this demise to, I'm going to hook him up, I'm going to send him out there. And in that, more people love him. You ever had a plan backfire? You ever tried to get vengeance and it backfired? Just me. By sending David away, more people like him. The sending of the evil spirit upon Saul is similar to God allowing Satan to afflict Job. God allows evil, but always uses it to accomplish his own good purpose. You know what's really ironic? It's interesting, actually. If you get a chronological Bible, the first time in 1 Samuel chapter 16, at the end of chapter 16, when it says, when the Spirit began to find, when the Spirit started coming on King Saul, and David would play for King Saul, the very next, in, in, the, in the, not in your, uh, systematic Bibles, but in, in the chronological Bible, the very next verse, now watch this, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now think about that, being, being oppressed by demons and being led by demons, and then David plays, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And that would chase the demons away. Evil spirits are ultimately under God's direction and control. All of their work, yes, even the most evil, is done under God's meticulous supervision. Nothing happens without God's knowing. God wills or allows absolutely everything that takes place. Saul was controlled by the evil spirit. Again, he was not possessed 
But he was manipulated, controlled at this point in time. Because you would see as you read this, he comes and he goes. He comes at, at will. He doesn't just stay and dwell. That He comes and goes. And again, what a contrast. Evil spirit controlled Saul, brought raving. You ever get so angry that you either want to hit something or you actually do hit something? And I joke, and I joke about this, but I'm serious. We actually, have, when I talk to people, if you get mad, I say, come to my house, we have a punching bag. We have big, big punching bags. But that's raving. And you know what that raving shows? When you get to that point of raving, that anger has completely taken control of your life. This is why Cain killed Abel. Because anger took control. Anger has taken completely control over Saul's life to why he's trying to kill him. You say, I could never do that. Yeah, I think Cain said the same thing. I'm sure Saul said the same thing. I'm sure most people who have murdered have said the same thing. I could never do that. The Bible tells us to, you say we cannot be taken in sin, take heed lest you fall. There's not a one of the Ten Commandments that we cannot break. We've already broken one anyway. We're guilty of breaking them all. And by the way, Jesus also says, You have heard it said, Thou shalt not hate. But I say unto you, well, I'm sorry, you should not kill. But I say unto you that if you hate your brother with no cause, you're a murderer. And all we see is Saul had been a murderer just because it was in his heart. But then he kept on acting on it. And he was not going to be content until David was dead. But again, who's he really after here? Let's be honest. Let's get down to the nitty gritty. God, I'm mad because you put them here. God, there's someone in my life that I'm, I'm, I don't like, I can't stand, and you put them here, Lord. You did it. And you let them go to my church. And you let them sit on my same row. And you made her my wife. I'm just kidding. That's not my... I love my wife. <laughs> so our honest problem is with God. Yet who's catching the blame? Saul kept setting David up for failure. Kept pushing him out there, waiting for him to die. Manipulation, manipulation versus trust. I'm going to read some of the most important things in this time where so often we try to manipulate the situation. God, I don't believe you can take care of my conflict. I don't believe you will. I don't believe you're going to take care of it the way I want you to. So I'm going to handle it my, myself. So we begin to bribe, gossip, plan pitfalls. These are just a few of the different ways manipulation rears its ugly head. And I'm going to tell you this right now. It is an unmistakable sign of one who will simply will not trust God with the details of their life. We try to take care of things and manipulate things in our own ways because we don't trust God to do it. <laughs> Can you see Saul thinking like this? God, you're the one that made David the next king. You're the one that took my kingdom away from me and gave it to him. It's a matter of perspective. See, it wasn't about Saul's kingdom. It was about God's kingdom. And God has the right to give his kingdom to whoever he wants to give it to. He doesn't have to have a reason or rhyme. He's God. But think about from Saul's point of view, and for, it is someone who, like Saul, may be dominant with spiritual gifts and natural talent. Saul was, hey, Saul was the kind of guy that because of his military record, because of his size, because of his accomplishments, he was a shoe-in. Everyone had to have him. But yet, you know what? All those spiritual gifts, all those natural talents, but they're willing to throw it all away because their spirit, because their ego is challenged. Their ego is threatened. 
And now we get to what this purpose, this entire conflict is over. And normally, let's be honest, we're honest with ourselves. Every conflict comes back down to my person, my, uh, who I am has been questioned. My pride has been questioned. That's why we're at conflict. It's not about God. It's about our pride. But again, in verse 17, we already read that. Not my hand of the Philistines be against him. Verse 21, again, he kept trying to get the Philistines to kill off David for him. But now let's look at David. Remaining righteous in your living. He continued to fight for Saul. Every time Saul sent him out there to battle to kill him, David would go out and come back victorious. David was still Saul's most obedient servant. No matter how many times he tried to kill him. And even in all this, he, David still behaves wisely. Look at verse 5 of our text. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. Verse 14 and 15. And David behaved wisely in all his ways. And the Lord was with him. In your conflict, do you want the Lord to be with you? If you do, then your pride has to leave. Because there's not enough room for the Lord to be with you in your pride. Prospering primarily means to act with insight, to be prudent, to give insight, to teach, to prosper, to consider, to ponder, to understand, to act prudently. To act with devotion, righteously, and honoring the once king. Everything that David did, he was this idea of, of behaving wisely was because he knew that Saul was God's anointed. And so he endured everything that came with that. And lastly, remain faithful. To your authorities. You know, we are, last couple of years we've seen this, you know, what is a Christian's responsibility to and respect with our authorities? Well, the, the Bible tells us that we are to, I didn't say you have to support them, agree with them, but we are supposed to pray for them. We're supposed to pray that God would give them insight, discernment, wisdom. Hopefully we're praying, Lord, that he would come to know you. Hey, a spirit-filled Joe Biden could rock the world. But how do we respond faithfully? Remember to respond faithfully to our authorities. Saul... Saul's disobedient to God still. He's still trying to kill David. David's the new king, really. Saul's response to God's person. So you see this. Saul doesn't like God's plan. God doesn't, Saul doesn't like God's new person. Again, it comes back down to this conflict is not between two kings. This conflict is between Saul and Almighty God. And I'm going to tell you, most of our conflicts are the same way. Most of our conflicts with each other is really, if we get technical, we need to get aside just me and God and say, God, we need to take care of this. Because let me tell you something. Once you and your conflict with God is dealt with, you and your conflict with your other person will be dealt with. Let me tell you something. You cannot live at peace with God and not be at peace with your brother. You cannot be at peace with God and not be at peace with your brother. You cannot. And we sit down and say, God, why aren't you blessing me? Why aren't... There you go.
David was caught in the middle between Jonathan's love and Saul's hate. He had to learn to wait and let God work out the obstacles that stood in the way of his becoming king. Saul's response to God's plan. Again, he didn't like God's plan. And maybe this is where our conflict really lies. Maybe we're saying, Lord, maybe we're our conflict. By the way, this is the beginning of your conflict. Ready? You're not going to do good in conflict if you and God have a conflict of who he's made you to be. If you're not content with who God's made you, you're going to have a problem with conflict. Because you're already in a conflict. God, I'm not happy with what you've made me. I'm not happy with where you've put me. I'm not happy with who you put me with. I'm not happy with the way I look, the size, whatever. Let's be honest. Today, I'm not happy with my gender. I'm very content with my gender. Thank you very much. So I was not speaking on my behalf. But discontentment with God is conflict with God. And we can't even talk about that yet because that's coming. And if we have conflict with God that we haven't dealt with, we're not going to be able to deal with our other conflict right. But now let's look at David. David's humility towards Saul hasn't changed. But I want to focus on this self-control. Now, this part I'm going to talk about is not in this text, but it comes later. It depends, and and because it depends on that. Well, yeah, David looks good in this chapter, but how does it look later when it's actually been some years? How about this? How about David has an opportunity in a cave to take out King Saul? Let me tell you something. You talk about a divine setup. There's no one in that cave. No one. Dark cave. Saul. David, that's it. I could kill him and tell God he died on natural causes. He got lost in the dark. He tripped over something. No, that's it. He goes up and cuts a piece of his cloak off just so he can come to him later and say, you know, I had an opportunity. I could have taken you out. But you know why he doesn't? Because he's faithful to his authority. And it's not just King Saul. It's faithful to the higher authority, God. And let me tell you something. If God tells us to love and encourage and uplift, he doesn't want us taking them out. But David had self-control. He could have taken him out. But David also is practicing it's not about me. God's already promised me I'd be king. You know what that means? And I'm not king yet, so I'm not going anywhere. Hey, let me tell you something. Y'all be in prayer. Pastor at Fellowship, you know, my pastor for a little bit of time before I came, for a year, he had a heart attack. And I told his wife, I said, listen, God just called him here for a purpose. It's not done yet. But it might be. Guess what? You're not going until your purpose is gone. So David says, hey, God, you promised me I'm going to be king one day. I'm not going to take out Saul. I'm going to let you deal with Saul. How about this? Again, later on, when Saul commits suicide, you would think that David's response would be, "Woohoo! I'm set free from the guy trying to kill me. I've never seen in Scripture a man so more broken than Paul was for the loss of King Saul. Now, he also lost Jonathan, his, his best friend, at the same time. So, he, so he's dealing with two spots of loss there. But even for Saul, he kept saying, My, how the mighty have fallen. He was so broken over King Saul's death. Would we... Be broken over the loss. Or not even the loss. Maybe it's just the, when, when the person that we don't like goes through a difficult time. Do we rejoice? Or are we broken? Do we hurt for them? Again, I'm reminded that Jesus sat down and washed 
Judas' feet with the same care, compassion that he washed Peter's and John's and the rest of the disciples. Now think about this too. Never have the conflict resolved and still be broken over the loss of your enemy. That is growing through conflict. They never had it resolved. That's growing through conflict. For 10 long years, Saul pursued David and tried to kill him. David experienced a full range of human emotion, fluctuating between hope and despair. Sometimes encouraged and other times he resorted to desperation, even joining the Philistines' army. That's like for me to go join Al-Qaeda. And why would I do that? Because this is where we start to see David start to dip. Because he began to start times, there were times where he did not fully trust God. Or maybe he just didn't like what God was doing. Nonetheless, yet God was working to perfect David even at the same time he was judging King Saul. You don't understand that this conflict you might be going through might be God judging someone else. Again, it's not always about us. Praying for the person that you're conflict with, conflict with is not enough. Prayer in of itself is not as powerful as honest submission. Submitting to what God wants. Does God want unity? Yes. The submission is to God first and then the other person in question. David did not submit to Saul's humanity, but he did submit to Saul's authority as the anointed king. The test of commitment is whether we can rest in the knowledge that the outcome has been transferred from our shoulders to God. Hey, that conflict, have you given it to God? Gene Edwards suggested if David had not experienced 10 years of pain, he would have grown up to be King Saul part two. But God used the external King Saul to cut away the Saul inside David's heart. The operation, by the way, took 10 years and was a brutalizing experience that almost killed the patient. Maybe God's working on you. And the surgery is called conflict. Is it going to take you out? Or are you going to grow from it? Saul grasped for the kingdom, but eventually God caused it to slip away from him. David refused to grasp it, and it was given to him in God's time. Saul was impatient with God and was abased. David waited for God and was exalted. And lastly, Psalm 37, 7 says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him to deal with your heart, to deal with the heart of the one you're in conflict with. Do not fret because of Him who prospers in this way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Where are you at in your conflict? Who's leading your conflict? Is the Spirit of God leading your conflict or are you leading your conflict? Because if it's you, then I think there's some, uh, some other spirits involved. And it's not the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit will only unify. Will only unify. Who's leading in your conflict? Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you all stand. I don't know where you are this morning. But who is leading in your conflict? How are you dealing with your conflict? Are you still angry and bitter at that other person? Or 
have you decided, you know what, I need to take care of this. And I need to get with them, and I need to apologize. I need to tell them, hey, you've offended me, you've hurt me. You need to fix it. I don't know what you, where you are, but there's an altar here. God knows where you are. Come talk to him about it. He, he'll tell you where you are. Just, you need to just take the whole conflict and lay it at the feet of Jesus. That's the best place to start with your conflict. Whatever you're holding on to, whatever you have, the bitterness, the pride, 
you know, this, hey, the insecurity laid at his feet. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful for examples like Saul and David. And Lord, there are times in this room that, Lord, each one of us, we've been Saul. Lord, we've been Saul that we know if we get right with you and we find out, Lord, we come to you that, Lord, we are in the wrong and we know it. But, Lord, because of our pride, we don't want to go and make it right. Because of our pride or, or just we're too arrogant or whatever it may be, Lord, that we do not take care of business. But, Lord, help us not to be so. Help us to lay our burdens at your feet. But Lord, if we're not Saul, we are David, Lord. Help us to continue to live wisely, to live righteously, no matter what people say to us, no matter what people do to us, no matter how much gossip is going around. Lord, we stay faithful to you. Lord, transform our lives. And Lord, it's when you transform our lives, you'll transform the way we go through conflict. And Lord, that at the end of the day, if we let you and your spirit lead and guide us in our lives, then truly we will grow in the conflict that you've placed us in. And we look to you and give you all honor and glory and praise. In your name I pray, amen. So before you leave, I need some gentlemen to help. We need to get the tables and chairs set up downstairs for next Saturday. If you'll help us with that, that'd be great. Um, and we want all y'all to be here next Saturday. We're having our shindig, our, our July fourth of uh, July sixth picnic and food and fun and games. So we want all y'all to be there this Saturday. Yes. So if we can get some help with the tables downstairs, it'd be awesome. Thank you. All right, we're going downstairs. I'm gonna be in a second. <clears throat> That's what young people think of old things.